Um, so I have the pleasure of getting to introduce Jenny. Uh, Jenny Massa currently works here at uh, the Mount Prospect Public Library as the program librarian supervisor in our Fiction AV team department. Um, she's been at Mount Prospect for just over seven years. Um, prior to, or actually in the middle of, I think, um, her two positions at Mount Prospect. She worked at Morton Grove as an adult services librarian where she uh, was responsible for coordinating the library volunteers. Jenny's passion for connecting people through reading led her to launching Let's Talk Books, which is a weekly bookshare, now bi-weekly bookshare program um, that we launched during the initial COVID lockdown at Mount Prospect. Let's Talk Books remains a really successful virtual program here at our library, and it has garnered its own following among book lovers who enjoy talking about what they're reading and are looking to expand their reading horizons. Um, Jenny's favorite romance trope is enemies to lovers. Her favorite book when pressed is The Great Believers by Rebecca Mackay, and she is my personal absolute favorite person to talk all things Taylor Swift with. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand the floor over to Jenny to teach us all some RA tips and tricks today. Thank you, Janine. Um, and I'm eagerly waiting for more news for Taylor Swift's next move, but I mean, any day now we'll get something. So I'm gonna be pulling up a PowerPoint. So let's see. All right, so you should all be seeing this PowerPoint right now. Um, so as you all know, we are gonna be talking about reader's advisory, particularly how you can bring that into the circulation desk. Um, and when we're talking about reader's advisory, uh, just so that we have a shared definition, we're essentially talking about connecting books with readers and creating an environment where it's the reader's experience with the books that matter, not necessarily the books themselves. So some definitions from the field, um, reader's advisory is the act of putting people together with the books they love. Um, a successful reader's advisory service is one in which knowledgeable, non-judgmental staff help fiction readers with their reading needs. So a lot of it is all about just the relationship you develop with the patrons over the fact that they're readers or they want to be readers or they're currently reading something. And yay, we like that. So um, advisory doesn't just look like a formal interview at a public service desk where a patron says, I read X, Y, Z, and I'm looking for one, two, three. What should I read next? Um, sometimes that does happen at the fiction desk, or at least at our desk at the fiction desk, um, but often it tends to be a lot more subtle. So um, advisory, it's someone asking for validation in their reading choice by asking you if you've ever read the author they are about to read. Or it's someone asking what a book that is on display is about so they know if it is worth their time to read it. Or it's someone looking for ideas and asking you at the desk as they're checking out if you've ever read any, or if you've read any good books lately, or if you've ever read a good book. So just like every question we get at the library, how we respond to these questions and talk to patrons matters. And with advisory, the more you feed into the book culture environment, the more that it'll grow and that growth will extend to drawing patrons in. Because remember, it's a lot about just the relationship and the growing relationship that you have with the patron. Um, of course, it's tough at the circulation desk because one, you have that golden rule of not commenting on people's materials. And then two, you don't have a lot of time on your hands. Um, however, you can still make a big impact. Um, so we're gonna go over four different ways that you can increase your impact, um, starting with what I believe is basically one of the best things that you can do and also requires barely any time. Um, and that is to cheerlead your patrons reading. So pay attention to how you react when people engage with you about popular materials. Even if you have a really, really long line of people that you're just trying to get through, um, if they comment on anything to you, just be affirming in their choices. If someone is so excited to pick up the newest Candice Cardi Williams book, be so excited with them. Um, if they ask you what a book is about and you don't know, that's totally fine. Um, what they're gonna remember is how you react, not necessarily that you know every single book that's been published on the face of the earth. 
Um, just saying, I don't know, isn't going to really do anything positive, really. If anything, it's going to discourage the patron from ever asking that again for fear of being shut down. Or I don't know if you will experience this. I get a lot of patrons that are afraid of um, uh, asking too much of me or 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 they don't want to be a, a bother to me when really I'm, I'm there for them. Um, so if you say something simple like, I'm not super familiar with that book, uh, but you'll have to let me know how you like it. Uh, that will go a long way because, because even though you're not really saying a lot in that statement, you're also not shutting the patron down. And then also they know that you care about their experience. And plus the most wonderful thing ever is when a patron actually takes you up on that and they come back and tell you um, next time their experience with the book. So one of the next things that you could do to increase your impact, and this is something that we're gonna spend a little bit more on. This is gonna be a little bit more about um, reader's advisory theory and some of the tools that we use to help connect people with books. And that is learn what appeal is and be comfortable using it. So appeal is essentially descriptive terms regarding a patron's or a reader's experience of a book. So as they're reading the book, is it hopeful? Is it filled with untrusty, untrustworthy characters that are gonna make you question everything? Is it taught with tension? Um, you can have only so many plots in the world. So that's where appeal comes in. That's essentially the seasoning that gives the book its unique flavor. So we'll take two books as an example. Um, Camilla Knows Best by Farah Haran and Take a Hint, Danny Brown by Talia Hibbert. Uh, when it comes down to it, the bare bones of these books are books about friends that become lovers, essentially. However, Camilla Knows Best is a heartwarming, sweet romantic comedy with a dash of coming of age in Bollywood, whereas Take a Hint, Danny Brown has banter-filled dialogue, a nuanced depiction of mental health, several see me moments and a dash of fake dating. Both are great books, but just very different. So if you have someone where they absolutely do not wanna write, read anything that has any little bit of um, steam in it, uh, the Talia Hibbert book won't be for them. On the same, in the same vein, if you have someone that absolutely loves steamy bits of books and um, goes out of their way to look for those scenes, they're not gonna find much of that and Camila knows best. They're, so they're not gonna be satisfied. So this is why um, getting into the grittiness of, of the appeal of the book is pretty essential where you can't just rely on an interesting sounding plot. It's all about how the book makes them feel. So there are a couple different categories of, of appeal. So we have tone, that's again, how the book how does the book feel? So is it suspenseful? Is it comforting? Is it light? Um, that's where you're gonna get kind of more of the mood of the book. And then you have characters. What are the number of characters? Is it a really large cast of people or is it a smaller, you only hear from one, one character? And what are they like? Are they funny? Are they in the process of growing? Then you have the language, which that's the author's writing style. Do they write lush and detailed? Are they more conversational in tone? Do they have lots of dialogue for the characters or are they describing uh, scenery more often? And then speaking of scenery, setting, what's the setting like? Is it like a character? Is it so at the forefront of the book? Um, does the time period jump around a lot? We have a lot of patrons where that's a really big make it or break it for them, where some of our patrons, they love that. They love getting to kind of flip between different time periods because to them, it makes the book move faster for them. Um, however, we have others that just get really, really confused. So sometimes for book discussions, we'll prep um, for a discussion um, by um, helping them figure out like what are the two different time periods and what are the characters um, featured in each of the different time periods. Um, and then the last one that I have on here is pacing. And I pulled um, some of the, the types of pacing. Pacing is um, 
essentially the speed at which a book moves through the story and how the reader experiences that movement. And that's another thing that um, a lot of appeal, all of, of appeal you could say makes a big difference to the reading experience, but pacing is a really, really big one because that's the thing that um, is, patrons are gonna often notice quicker. Um, is this book dragging on and on for them? Um, is it a little bit more fast paced where um, you have shorter chapters and um, they end with cliffhangers and the words that are the language that's being used is a little bit more straightforward so you don't have to spend a lot of time putting the pieces of the sentences together or looking up books in a dictionary or looking up words in a dictionary. Um, or um, is the, the book a little bit more leisurely paced? So I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, uh, a Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara. That's a really thick book um, and where you really dive into the characters and you're immersed in the story. Um, someone that's looking for something where they can just like go, 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 go isn't going to enjoy that. And on the flip side, someone is looking that's looking for something that they can really sink their teeth in and just immerse their, themselves into that world is also not going to really like one of those go, go, go type of books. So the nice thing with appeal is you don't need to come up with all of these terms yourself. Um, so this pacing information, this actually came from uh, the secret language of books, which is um, linked on your resource sheet. That's a story elements um, tool developed by Novelist. Um, also on Novelist, it's super easy to look up books and then their individual appeal information. Um, and Novelist is, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's essentially a database where um, it has an index of different books and then information about that book, those books. So it'll pull title, summary, reviews from professional resource or from professional journals and appeal terms and read alikes and all sorts of things. So um, a lot of times how readers advisory looks like at the uh, like your popular materials desk or wherever you have people um, stationed to answer these questions. Um, they tend to be a lot about figuring out what mood the reader is in um, and what they're currently looking for. So you're kind of diving into um, what they've read recently that they've liked. You've, you're diving into um, what they um, read recently that they didn't like. So you're getting into the nitty gritty. So you won't necessarily have a lot of time, of course, to do um, that deep dive at the circulation desk. But what you can do is um, kind of know these appeal, like um, the bits and pieces of, of books that people are interested or, or why they like to read what they read. So you're, you, you learn what is connecting books to people and those connectors are appeal. So it's helpful to know appeal for that reason. And then it's also particularly helpful because when you're in a time crunch, if you're sharing a book with a patron, rather than spending five minutes going into a plot and, and telling them every single thing about what happens up in the book, you just give a line or two about the plot and then you spend five minutes uh, or then you spend um, maybe like another sentence or two actually talking about the reading experience. So pulling a couple of these different appeal terms from, um, from a resource like Novelist. Or if you don't even have much time in the moment to dive into a book, if you know even one small detail about a book, um, saying, oh, that's fast paced, or oh, that's haunting, that'll at least give you something. So if a patron is asking you, um, like, have you read the newest James Patterson book? Maybe you haven't read the newest James Patterson book, but often his books have a fast pace to them. Um, so that's something that you can can comment on. It's like, oh, I'm sure it's going to be really um, like a edge of your sweet quick read. Um, and so that'll just give you some information. And um, one of the other things that you can do then to get these appeal words is pull up novelist um, and basically do some work ahead of time to make sure that you're, you're nice and comfortable with appeal. Um, so that'll help you in those moments where a patron's asking, what's this book on the display like? Uh, display, yeah, what is this look? I, I need a drink of water, I guess. 
kind of lost my steam. Um, so if a patron is asking you, um, what is this book on this display about? If you spend a little time ahead of time looking at the display and, and pulling out a couple different books, then um, that'll give you, um, that'll prep you for when you're in the moment with them. Um, for practice too, one of the best things that you can do is start with yourself. So for the books that you read, keep in Excel file or, or journal or some sort of log and write down the titles you've read and pull up a list of appeal factors and highlight the ones that you think applies for the book. Um, so I would suggest making this as simple as possible. Um, so if you end up um, being someone that like starts off, I do this all the time. I have like my fancy little bullet journal and I'm going to um, write down the summary and my, my reading experience of it and a couple different appeal words and maybe like a one or two sentence review about it. Um, if you're someone that can keep that up, great. <laughs> I am very impressed. Um, but if you're, if you're someone like me where it's like, well, if I have to spend 20 minutes on a task every time, I don't know that I'll spend that 20 minutes on that task. So just keep it simple uh, as much as possible. Just the act of doing it will expand your vocabulary and it'll also help you find the different patterns that you get with books. And then um, one thing you'll notice as you do that, um, if you haven't noticed already, um, so speaking of patterns, the more time you spend with books, the more you'll notice the different trends going on and the tools that publishers use to try to match their books up with, with readers and patrons. So noticing these details about books will help you when you're in the thick of it with a patron. So we are going to play a little genre game. Um, so I'm going to be, uh, let me see if I can pull up. Okay. So I'm going to be um, pulling up some different covers and we're gonna play guess that genre. So if you think you know what the genre is, you can throw it in the chat. If not, I promise I'll tell you. So starting with our first couple books. So just judging by cover, we got mystery and specifically cozy mystery. Perfect, great, yeah. So you can tell that because you get a lot of different um, punny, cute titles, like Up to No Gouda, I like that, um, or Booked for Death, which is like a B&B &B, um, bookish mystery. Um, you also get a lot in Cozy Mysteries, if you're a reader of them, or if you've dived into them, you'll notice a lot of times the, the danger happens off off the off the pages or at least like the big violent moments so um, you'll see a little bit of these like skull and crossbones throughout I like with the Gouda one you can see it within the cheese um, but it's cutesy it's not going to be something that you're going to read expecting a lot of like blood and gore um, so we'll do our next next one any guesses as to what genre this is that suspense thriller, thriller. Yeah. Oh, one last one. I just went broad and just did thriller. So um, you get really um, dark, shadowy uh, covers, um, pretty intense titles when no one is watching. Next up, we are watching Eliza Bright, pretty intense. Um, oftentimes you don't get to see like full faces of people or people on these covers. Um, that's not to say every single, um, uh, every single cover is going to have someone um, that is, or that every single cover is going to look exactly like this, but it is going to um, say that um, this is kind of an overarching trend and theme of what a thriller looks like. And then, oh, and it looks like we do have a question already. What is actually the difference between suspense and thriller? And Nanette, you answered that really, really well. Um, where thriller has like that fast external action. Um, so a lot of it is kind of um, a, a lot of uh, crossover where you'll have a lot of um, 
thrillers that have suspense in them, but um, there is like a subtle, unique element to, to the differences. And then moving to the next one, we have any guesses as to this genre? Yeah, historical fiction. Perfect. Yes, we have historical fiction, World War II. So again, with these covers, um, you'll notice you'll have like a couple different planes, um, characters that aren't necessarily facing the reader, they're looking into the distance. There's actually a whole bunch of books with um, women looking in the distance and planes and usually some sort of like um, city on the cover, uh, but I only chose one to put on there. You'll also have some um, items that are symbolic, so, so with some symb symbolism, um, or you'll have characters that are kind of looking into the distance a lot. And then for our next one, and this will be our last one. Any guesses? Yeah, sci-fi. So a lot of these, even if you're familiar with the title, you'll you'll kind of notice. So science fiction, you get um, spaceships on them. You'll get kind of more a tech look to it, kind of like inversion control robots. Um, the Ted Chiang one um, has sort of like a space element kind of looking looking at it, looking looking like a little spacey. Um, so again, a lot of publishing is gonna be trends and noticing what these trends and details are will go a long way. So, um, and how this relates to appeal is many genres will have some of the same appeal. So for thrillers, often you tend to get like that fast pace and, um, you, like you can even have unreliable unre narrators in it. Um, more literary books is gonna have a more leisurely pace. So these type of context clues will help you when you're in the moment with the patron. Another thing that you can look at is what is said on the cover. So kind of do a quick glance over the cover. So for this Leviathan Wakes book, um, you have a quote from George R.R. R. Martin on it, kick-ass space, space opera. Um, that's going to tell you if you're not really familiar with the whole series. I believe there's like 15 or 16 books in that series. All of them are very long books. That's going to tell you it's going to be a more immersive epic story. You also have the word opera on it. So that's going to um, entail, again, diving into that um, into that book. And then you also see George R. R. Martin. He's known for some pretty big door stoppers. And yes, Judy, so to a certain extent, you can judge a book by its cover. Um, perfectly shared. Um, okay, so um, another thing that you can do back to getting comfortable with, with books is spending time on novelists. So if there is a lull at work and you don't need to be doing something, I highly suggest just looking up the books you've read, popular books, books on display around you, anything like that and finding the appeal information. Um, so for this book, I just did a little screen cap of it. Um, you get the description of the book. Um, this is just searching a book on novelist by title and pulling up its record. Um, then you get a little bit of information about um, the book itself. So what the tone is like. So you know this is not gonna be a super intense, serious tear jerker just by looking at the words that novelist chose. Um, you know it's gonna be a lot more lighter and fun and um, most likely a bigger cast of people um, since it says large cast of characters. Um, another place on Novelist 2 is um, underneath the, the information about the book itself. Um, there will be the reviews from professional journals, so like Publisher Week, Publishers Weekly, Kirkus Reviews, and Booklist. And that those journals, a lot of uh, librarians or library staff or people in the book world in general write those reviews, and they're most likely going to be using appeal. Um, as they're writing those. So you're going to get more examples as to how you can talk about books by reading those reviews. 
Another neat resource to spend a little bit more time on would be, oh, actually, just before I, I go over there, um, this is another part of Novelist. Um, this is the read-alike section on it. So for a book, you can click to see what the title read-alikes are. And um, this is helpful because one, it kind of helps you connect books to each other. So if you had someone that read Dial A for Aunties and they are wanting something similar to that, you have these pre-generated, this pre-generated list of books that um, are similar to it and they explain why they're similar to them. Um, that's also helpful though for getting more comfortable with appeal because you're going to be um, seeing like what elements of one book might draw someone else. So in this first one, what happens now? Um, you have comedies, misadventures, funny books, um, and then a little bit of a like similarity in plot. Um, for Siri, who am I? You have suspicious accident, um, fun and exciting stories. Um, and then you see that there's elements of romance in it too. So, um, Read-alikes can also be a, a tool for one, helping find read-alikes for a patron. And then also two, again, seeing how people connect books to each other in order to, to help their patrons find new things to read. So another neat resource would be um, the website Storygraph. Um, this, if you're not familiar with it, it's kind of like Goodreads and Goodreads and Storygraph are essentially um, websites where you can mark the books that you've read, the books that you want to read. They're basically uh, book logs. Um, and for Storygraph, what's kind of neat about this is they have a place where after you read a book, you can um, mark what moves are essentially in the book. Um, so all of this is user generated. But so for Blacktop Wasteland, we see most people find this book tense and dark. Um, but there are other elements in that too. Um, you also get to see people's experience of the pace too of the book. Um, this also kind of shows you how every reader is, is a different reader. Um, so some people mark this book as fast paced to them um, and 2% marked it as slow. Um, it could be that those, those um, readers that marked it as slow pace was, um, kind of like tense dark books aren't their thing. So they they had to kind of keep taking breaks from it. And it could be um, uh, something else, of course. I, I can't read their, their, their minds. Um, and then you'll also see um, character information on the side too about it. Um, it looks like we had a question about Novelist, if it's Novelist free. Um, Novelist is um, a paid database that your library would have to subscribe to. Um, if you have a library card, it's free for you to use. Um, if your library does not have Novelist, um, it would be something that would be really good for them to explore further. I'm not sure, I don't purchase our databases, so I'm not sure the price of it, but if you're helping patrons, it is a really useful tool. Okay, so that was StoryGraph. And so our next thing that you can do that will make a really big amp impact is go out of your way to seek diverse authors. Um, so I'm gonna just read this quote just because it's really powerful. Um, the question why diversity is one diverse authors tend to answer rather than ask. We already understand the need for it because we already know what it is to grow up with the loneliness and self-doubt that springs from never seeing your own reflection in literature. We bear the costs of our absence and of the distortion of our cultures and identities by others. But there is a cost to everyone else too because we are all living in a diverse reality that is only becoming more so, which means that if you can't hear our voices, you can't hear the world. So I'm sure at this point, many of you have heard about the concept of books being windows and mirrors and how important it is to have books that we see ourselves in and also books to see into the world. Um, publishing and marketing uh, in, within publishing have been doing the reading world a severe disservice where even though there has been some work done in the uh, like act of purchasing from authors of titles that are 
more diverse in the promotion of their work, there still needs to be a lot of work done. Um, I was reading this Twitter thread by Melinda Lowe, um, who her most recent book is Last Night at the Telegraph Club. And she was talking on Twitter about how the, the definition of a commercial success, essentially, and how until recently, it was very rare for authors of color or queer authors to make it to the New York Times bestseller list. So in that context, she was talking a lot about how um, if you're defining success as an author by making it to the New York Times bestseller list, you can't essentially, that is a very limited definition of success. And there's a lot of hurdles that go into the way to make it onto the New York Times bestseller list, especially for an author of color or queer author. Um, and she was talking about how in 2009, she had a book named Ash that was up for a couple of different um, rewards uh, awards. And this was a lesbian retelling of Cinderella and how she ended up being like docked points essentially because it didn't have a coming out of story coming out story. And the idea was that anything with a queer character had to be a coming out story and not just their lived experience. Um, and she was saying that um, they also noted that it didn't seem realistic, even though it's a fantasy novel. Um, so she had these extra set of um, jump, ho hoops that she had to jump through just because she had a queer queer character. And then she was talking about how as an author of color, um, she's noticing that things have changed and she was using her recent book um, last night at the Telegraph Club, which was on the indie bestseller list for two weeks, which is awesome. Although on the flip side, it didn't touch the New York Times bestseller list at all. Um, and um, part of this too is, um, I'm gonna go into the next slide. Um, this is gonna be a graph. Um, so this is from, um, information uh, through 2018, um, and this is from New York Times. They did an article in 2020 about just how white is the book industry, and this is basically the percentage of books published, um, polling from a bunch of the different bigger publishing houses, and how in 2018, 11% of books in 2018 that were being published were written by people of color. And so even just the sheer amount of books versus um, uh, just the books in the world, like that is a very, very large ratio. Um, I was trying to find to see if there were any current numbers that were a little bit more comprehensive of um, different publishing houses. Um, I couldn't find anything that pulled from a bunch, um, but Publishers Weekly was sharing data about Penguin Random House. They did an audit about how uh, white contributors accounted for 76% of books released in the 2019 to 2021 period, um, which is significantly higher than the 60% white people compromised in the US generally, general population. And interestingly, the 76% of um, white authors that were being released pretty much correlated closely to the 74% mark that white people represent in the public or Penguin Random House workforce. Mm. So a lot of it is, um, so they were drawing the conclusion or people working for Penguin Random House was kind of drawing the conclusion that um, they're like, it's not, a coincidence that that number is really close to the um, uh, white employees, um, which is one of the really, really big reasons why we as librarians have to go out of our way to make sure that we are advocating for these books that are being published um, and how it's not enough even just to buy diverse books and it's not enough to just put them on a display. Um, we have readers that have their own biases where if you think about it, so I'm like in my thirties for most of my year or for most of my life, um, um, I would have been exposed to more books by white authors than authors of color if I didn't really do anything to, to pull myself out of that. Um, so we're all gonna have our own natural biases um, and um, it's something where having staff being able to advocate for these books is going to help nudge some readers to broaden their, their reading in general. Um, and um, 
big way to start doing that is just starting again with yourself, kind of like with getting more comfortable with appeal, start with yourself. Um, at the bare minimum, just pay attention to what you read and just note it. If you notice that all of the books you read are by authors who are white, cisgender, heterosexual, men or women, um, just kind of look why, like where are your book suggestions coming from and what happens in your brain when you pass up a book from an author of color? And then who do you follow on social media to get your books? Um, and um, actually social media in general, following people from all different walks of life is a fantastic way to broaden your world. So um, if you're on TikTok, on YouTube, Instagram, all of them have their subcultures. So book talk is on TikTok. Um, Booktube is on YouTube, and you guessed it, Bookstagram is on Instagram, and they're great ways to just explore, and um, my only advice with that is even that can get kind of um, within a similar bubble, so like with my own like TikTok whenever I'm looking for books and stuff, I kind of have to intentionally try to seek out um, and interact with, with um, just different content creators uh, because social media is going to kind of keep showing you the same thing over and over again. So look for, for people that aren't just sharing the same five books over and over again. Um, and obviously social media stuff, you wouldn't really be able to do that at work. Um, but something that you could potentially do would be um, looking at different heritage months. Um, a lot of times for heritage months, library bookstores and different media sites will feature books by authors from different heritages heritages. Um, and that's a great way to kind of seek out different, different um, books. And, um, and again, thinking of appeal being the big connector too. So if you're um, a person, I'm a really big fan of romantic comedies, and it is so fun to see all of the different um, stories popping up in romantic comedies from different cultures. Um, so as Janine mentioned earlier, I'm a big enemies to lovers person. Um, I also like um, the fake dating too. Um, so finding books like within your your little your your gateways essentially um, will just enrich your reading life essentially. And then um, our last um, topic would be essentially um, since there's limited limitations to um, how you can start conversations with patrons about what they're reading. Basically just create situations where patrons are more likely to engage with you about books. So for an example, um, if you are able to do a staff pick display in your lobby or by the surf desk, um, just putting together a display of staff favorites will, will help a lot. Um, as you'll have browsers essentially looking at things or and um, possibly commenting on them to you. Um, and if you even want to kick it up a little bit more, you can even add like a post-it note or a bookmark with a few different appeal terms on it to entice people. Um, you could also wear something um, noting what book you're currently reading. Um, so it could be if you have like a, a button maker, um, you could wear a little button on your on your lanyard, or if you don't have a button maker, um, you could make your own little tag of I'm currently reading and then write, or you um, print out a little picture of the cover um, and place that title or cover on your little name tag thing. Um, and if you have time and interest, um, you could participate in different bookish programs that your, your library puts on. Um, so for an example, Janine, I'm gonna call you out. Um, she's a great example of this where she'll attend some of our, our programs and um, it's great because then patrons will see her and be um, eager to chat books with her about it. It's, it's awesome and a way to connect with, with your, your patrons on a, on a different plane. Um, if you can't do that in your personal time, um, you could always make the case to your, your um, supervisor about it being a, a learning experience where essentially you're learning more of what your library is doing and then you're also learning, um, uh, you're, you're connecting with the patrons to create a better relationship with them. 
Um, and then the last thing would be if you have the space, putting up a little small display like on an easel with a book that you're currently loving right now in front of you. Um, if you don't have that space or if you're not allowed to take books away from the collection since it can make it hard to find um, for patrons and for staff um, trying to grab the books for the patrons. Um, you could always do like a little mini sign of it, like a collage essentially. Um, we'll have uh, display cases where a lot of our staff will make collages essentially of books within the case and they're really appealing and I'll see people stopped and, and looking at them all the time. Um, so with all of this, basically the more you engage with books, the more nimble you're going to become. So a big thing is just talk books as much as you can with your colleagues. Um, if you have um, content being created on your library website, look at that, see what is being created for your patrons and what books are being promoted. Um, I just took a little screen cap of one of the books off of a, um, of a new fiction list that one of our readers advisors put up on our website um, where um, they, they do often um, every month they put together a list of new books and then they'll put title summary and then a little bit of appeal. So family saga, you got the character information, more character information with the alternating points of view and then writing style with, or language with the vibrant writing. Um, so that's another great way to just stay connected to books in general. Um, shop your displays, um, see what books your patrons are seeing as they come in and spend time with them. Again, a lot of readers advisory is preparing ahead of time. So that's one way that you can prepare ahead of time is just being familiar with what's on display. Um, and then following book culture online, the resources that I, um, that we sent out what, uh, are just basically a starter list of different websites that you can go to. Some are just general um, pop culture type um, places, but they do all have some sort of book element to them. Um, whereas some are a little bit more niche where there are some websites that are just specifically on science fiction fantasy. So um, following the news that your patrons are our um, following will help a lot. Um, at the library, one of the collections I select for are uh, large type books. Um, and I'll just read the AARP website to see what articles they have listed up there, just to sort of see what books are being promoted and seeing if I can get them in large type. So it's really helpful. And then the last thing, um, I promise you I'm not a plant for novelist. Um, but uh, Novelist is just a really helpful starter tool and even more with advanced tool too. Um, so they have a lot of information on there. Um, so spend time on, um, they have genre guides. I'll show you an example in just a moment. Um, but they also do webinars, um, crash course webinars on different topics. So if you have staff development time, um, you can spend your time just kind of immersing yourself more in these different um, genres and topics. Um, and I'll forward on to, whoops, too far. Oh no, oh no, problems. Okay, <laughs> the best laid plans. Um, I will follow up and get this back up real quickly. Uh, okay. See, now we're revisiting everything that we learned. Look at all these beautiful covers. Okay, here we go, genre guides. Um, so this is an example. I just pulled the Gothic fiction one. Um, it's, they're super neat. Um, they'll pull the top themes in that genre essentially um, or subgenre because um, they'll do a, a whole bunch of different types of, of guides. Um, they'll also talk about the common characteristics in these novels. Um, there's another header about why uh, readers like these books which kind of gets you in the mind of the reader. And then we'll go into key titles. So um, it's a really great way to just kind of read up onto different genres in general. Um, so that's basically a very, very quick 101 um, about how you can bring advisory into the circulation department and connect with readers. 
Um, if you have questions, um, I'd be more than happy to answer them right now. You can also email them to me. And um, I haven't fully made the transition yet to Storygraph, but I am on Goodreads. So if you do want to connect with other readers on Goodreads, um, you can find me there. Um, so one of the questions is, will we have access to this recording in slides? Um, I believe you'll have access to the recording and then Amina, would they be able to have access to my slides? Um, if you usually, you can send them to me and I can send them. I usually send an after, um, okay. after program email. So that will, if you're okay with sharing that, Jenny, then we can do that for sure. And then I think someone asked, uh, Madeline asked if, is, if Novelist is free. Oh yeah, um, so Novelist, it's not, free um, for the library. So it's a paid subscription with the database or it's a database, um, but it is free to use for library card holders. So if your library doesn't have it, you could always check if your home library has it. Um, and if your work library does not have it, I, if you want to spend more time with advisory, I highly suggest it. Okay. And then usually in that email, everyone, I will send out, um, well, you'll have it on the slides, but I also send out um, Jenny's email and her Goodreads information as well. Yeah. And then um, speaking of, oh, we have another question. Oh, great, another question. So do you have a website slash tool that you use specifically for finding diverse books or books by diverse authors? Um, they use novelists and we need diverse books, but I don't know many others. Um, I, so one of the, this is particularly for um, uh, uh, like books with LGBTQIA plus themes. Um, one of the resources that I linked was um, LGBTQ reads and that actually covers youth, um, teen and adult. So I like that one a lot. Um, honestly, um, I will, I, this is where I find um, it most beneficial to follow different content creators on social media. I understand though that that takes a lot, a lot of time um, because you have to find them essentially. Um, I could always put together a small list of different content creators that I've really enjoyed and have gotten a lot of books from. Um, and then we can send that out as well. Um, oh, lovely. Um, Brittany shared um, a list that she has from a past ILA conference, um, which has a whole bunch of different um, websites that also it looks like for kids too. Um, another thing would be, um, uh, trying to think for user generated, um, you'd have to be careful with this, but Goodreads people have compiled like the best antis or like anticipated literary reads by authors of color in 2022. Um, so that's something that you could look for too to get more titles. Um, and then I can't think of any others that I haven't mentioned yet off the top of my head, but I can um, go into my bookmarks. And thank you, Amina will be including um, Brittany's links as well in the post email. So thank you, Brittany and Amina and Jennifer for the question. Oh, well, that's awesome. Um, Don just shared in the chat, um, our library is currently doing a diver diversity audit of our entire fiction collection and a few circ department people get to work on it, including me. It has been a great way to find titles I want to read on my own, which that is a great way. Um, the more you work in our seeking books too, um, there are advisory lists where um, uh, we try to make sure that we have um, at least a bare minimum number of representation. If we have more, that's lovely. Um, but so um, diving into like a topic of like beach reads for the summer where you're looking for um, some very like specific type of books, um, diving into trying to find authors of color for that if, if there aren't any readily available, you end up with a lot on your to read list. It's, it's wonderful. Any other questions? And honestly, um, 
to push the book share a little bit that we'll be doing in a little bit, um, hearing other people uh, talk about books is a good way to learn about more books in general. Um, so I know a lot of times in our um, Let's Talk Books program that we often do, um, that right now is run by different staff members, um, which is awesome because we all have very different interests in books, um, but we'll often make sure that we are um, pushing books that may not have been noticed by others because they are, um, written by an author of color and they might have a name that a um, person might be like, oh, I'm, I'm intimidated, which is silly. Um, but we'll spend time talking about the book. So again, you're trying to defy people's biases by thinking, oh, that book's not for me when it is for them. They just are making those initial judgments. Any other questions, comments, 